Good morning, church. It's good to be with you. I want to open by asking a question. Growing up, what were some of your favorite stories? What were some stories when you were young that just captured your imagination, that just drew you in when you heard them, when somebody read them to you? I know for me, when I was uh, young, growing up, I remember The Three Little Pigs, Goldilocks, one of my favorite books, Good Night Moon, and all the Berenstein Bear books, right, and the short stories that came with it. But also, when I got a little older, when I was at school, I remember reading A Brave New World, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and even as I got a little older, Pilgrim's Progress. Great stories, magnificent stories. But how do great stories draw us into them, want us to live into them, right? Get our imaginations moving and going. Well, a lot of great stories, they start fast. They go from zero to 60 and insert you into the action, into the drama right away. But there are also other stories that set the scene, set the context from the very beginning as the author invites you into the world that he has created. And many of those masterful stories, they begin with powerful opening lines, like once upon a time. It all started when? personal favorite of mine, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? But also, how about in the beginning? Have you ever considered that the Bible is actually a big story? It's a grand story. It's an epic drama telling one singular story and that you are a character in that story and you play a pivotal role. Now, we're not the main character but we are in this story. Now, growing up, I was taught a lot about the Bible. I was told the stories of the Bible. And as I got a little older, I learned that the Bible contains 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, written by about 40 authors in three continents and three languages over 1,600 years. But I was never really taught that all of these pieces, all the biblical stories, all the 66 books actually were teaching one singular story about a God who loves his people and loves his creation. As I was thinking about the sermon, I asked my wife, I said, when I tell you that the Bible is a big story, Alicia said, well, I think about Adam and Eve in the garden, I think about the beginning, I think about Noah's Ark, I think about Ten Commandments, and stories like David and the Goliath, right? Daniel and the lion's den, Jesus, and the book of Revelation with all the, the stories of the end times. And I said, absolutely. Those are pieces of God's grand puzzle. Yes, they are. But how would you summarize all of those pieces fitting into the whole, the singular story of the Bible? How would you do that? Well, some of my seminary professors and wonderful authors, Michael Goheen and Craig Bartholomew, they wrote in a masterful book titled, The Drama of Scripture, Finding Our Place in the Biblical Story, and they say, and I quote, the Bible is a true story, a universal story, a cosmic history about, his God, about God, his people, the world that he created them to live in. It begins with creation and human rebellion And it runs through the history all the way to Israel and then to Jesus and then on through the church, moving to the coming of the kingdom of God. And at the very center of this story, they say, is the man, the person, and the work of Jesus Christ in whom the story is centered and in which us and our world finds its purpose and meaning. In short, the big story of the Bible includes four grand acts of God. We see creation, we see the fall and the rebellion, but yet we see God at work, we see redemption, and we see and we long for restoration. Our story, the biblical story, it is an epic love story of a God who loves his people, who created all things good, who loves them. It's a story, but it's also a story filled with heartache, with horror, with lament. There's also comedy, there's song, there's miracles, there's historical events, there's wisdom literature in it. 
It is a story in which all stories find their place. It is the story. And it is designed to be understood, to be loved, to be told to this generation and to the next. This is the story that we're going to dive into this morning. My hope and prayer is that we take it in by the power of the Spirit, illuminating the beauty, the goodness of the story, the fullness of it, and that we would be a people who would tell our children and they would tell their children this just story would pass down from generation, that we would be a people who have the boldness and the courage to tell this story. So join me in prayer and let's ask for that boldness. Amen? Lord, we love you. We need you. Lord, you are at work from the beginning to the end because you are the Alpha and the Omega. Lord, it is only through your Son that we have redemption and that we have the hope of restoration. But Lord, we live in a broken world with broken bodies, broken relationships, brokenness everywhere that permeates everything. And Lord, we need to be reminded of the hope that we have in you, that it is secure, that you love us, that you're for us, and that you have always been with us and will continue to be in this life and in the life to come. Lord, we love you. Lord, we need you. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. Now, we are finishing our series today on the 10 statements of faith. And as we have been covering these big statements about what it is that the scriptures teach, that what we believe as followers of Christ, we're finishing this series by looking at the big biblical story that pulls on all the pieces and all the parts the grand narrative, the biblical story that tells us what the universal timeline is in which all stories find their place, including Noah's Ark, right? Daniel's in the, lion, Daniel's in the lion's den. Jesus, the resurrection, even all historical events about, right, the Great Pyramids or Columbus sailing across the sea, as well as, right, the Gutenberg Press or the Industrial Revolution, all of these pieces find their place on this timeline, in God's history, in God's story, in our story. But we are seeing that the main framework of this story, our story, is creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. But because we live in a world that distorts this story, the Holy Spirit has spoken through different authors in the scriptures to tell us the true story, that we would be reminded of the true story. And our apostle Paul He tells us in Colossians chapter one, he tells us the true story and he tells it in a concise way and he focuses in on the main character of the story. Let's take a look at this. Colossians chapter one, verses 15 through 23. This is what he says. He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and they are for him. And he, Jesus, is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you once were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, in which I, Paul, became a minister. Paul declares from the very beginning of our story that us, the human race, we weren't a mistake We didn't haphazardly just come into existence. 
the world and all of us here, we are the, the product, the intentional work of an intentional God created for the very purpose to glorify God. That's what we're here for. That is what our world is for. Theologians say of this section in Colossians that this section should be titled either the preeminence of Christ, the supremacy of Jesus Christ, or the hem of Christ because Jesus Christ is God and we're being told that he is the creating agent of all that is, that he is the author of the big story. Paul says in verses 15 and 16, he, Jesus Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, which is alluding to his supremacy, not that he was created. For by him all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, were created. All things were created through him. And who are they for? For him. Absolutely. We are being presented here the person work of Jesus Christ as supreme. But that also Jesus was there in the very beginning of the big story. That God is at work. That the second member of the Trinity, the Son of God, in his pre-incarnate form, is at work in creation. The Apostle John tells us and confirms for us exactly this in John chapter 1. And he says, in the beginning, familiar? Right? Genesis 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him, Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We are being told in the New Testament that the son of God was there from the very beginning. We have a triune God, father, son, Holy Spirit. The son of God, right, was there, pre-incarnate form, breathing life into all things, creating all all things, the agent, the medium of creation. Paul says, John says, we're being told this. When God spoke, ex nihilo, out of nothing came everything. And the purpose of everything is to reflect back to God his radiance, his majesty, his glory, and his honor. We, his people, and all of creation. That is what we have been purposed and been designed for. That's why Paul says all things are through him, Jesus, and they are for him. And how did God make all things? He made things very good, very good. But the reality is we know in this grand story that things don't stay very good for very long. Unfortunately, this story gets pretty gory very quickly. Paul alludes to this horrific turn in our big story in verse 21. And he says to the church in Colossae, he says, you were once alienated, hostile, evil in God's eyes, right? That we were separated from God because of sin. That we, the human race, as descendants of Adam and Eve, that once upon a time before we trusted in the person and work of Jesus Christ, we were steeped in sin. We inherited sin from Adam, but we compound that by making sinful choices, dishonoring choices, thoughts, words, deeds, motivations all the time, and separated from God. And that is the reality, that that is true. But you might say, well, where did this come into the story, though? Because didn't God make everything very good? He did, right? And that's when we would cue the Lego song, everything is awesome, because in the beginning, everything was awesome, right? The birds, the animals, everybody working together in perfect harmony, right? Everything is awesome. It was. It was very good. 
But then it wasn't. And Moses tells his generation, has it written down to pass on to the next generation the story of where it went wrong? And we're going to read part of that story. He says in Genesis chapter 3, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate, because Adam was there. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden in shame. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, well, the woman that you gave to me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? When God says, what is this that you have done? He is leaning into the fact that now sin, pain, death have just been brought into his creation. Separation, alienation is now here and that their act of rebellion has changed the course of history. Everything was awesome. Now it's not. That's the reality. Reality is now corrupted. It's twisted, distorted, and marred from its origin, from the beauty and our intimate relationship with God, which was perfect, healing joyful, feeling full, feeling enough all the time with God and God's good creation now broken. You want to know why death is a part of our reality now? Why animals are naturally afraid of us? Why earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires are destroying the surface of the earth? Why Cain killed Abel and murder continues to happen? Why nations endlessly war with one another over resources, land, religion, and respect? Why the word enough is not something that's really present in most of our human experience? Why our children rebel against us? Why our bodies, they tear, they stretch, they bloat, they're riddled with disease and deteriorate over time? It's because of the fall. It's because of the rebellion, because of sin that brought death. For Paul says the wage of sin is what? It's death. The biblical story tells us why things are the way they are. It gives context, helps us make sense of the chaos that we are steeped in in this world. That is the reality. We see selfishness, division, manipulation, pain, and death, and we experience it. Sometimes in our body and sometimes in relationships in the world and at work and in school. The fall explains why we are so broken, why our relationships are broken, and why the world is broken. Paul even tells us in Romans 8 that the creation itself, it groans and longs to be restored because it itself was broken too. I used to think that if I was Adam and I was in the garden when this was happening, I would have just slapped that right out of Eve's hand and been like, not today, Satan. But the reality is, when I assess the accurate state of my heart, I would have made the same choice. The fruit looked good. 
probably smelled good. It was good to make one wise, to be God-like. Who wouldn't choose wisdom and to be God-like? The reality is, is, I probably would. And you would too. That is a humbling fact about us. Our representatives, descendants, Adam and Eve, they did, but if you were in their shoes, given the same opportunity, you would too, and I would too. But the good news in this story is, it doesn't stop there. We are not left in our helpless estate, eternally separated from God, because what God does is he promises to fix what we broke right after we broke it. Good news that comes to us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. If you don't know, Genesis 3.15 is often called the first gospel, the first promise of good news. It doesn't come all the way in Exodus or Isaiah or the Psalms. It actually comes in Genesis 3.15. And this is what we are told. This is God speaking. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, Satan, and hers, Eve's. And he, a descendant of Eve, shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15, God is speaking to the serpent on one side and he's speaking to Eve on the other and he's saying, there is going to be animosity, there's gonna be hostility between the descendants of Satan and my chosen people, the descendants through Adam and Eve. And you, Satan, and your people are going to hate my people and hate me. And your descendants are going to strike a blow on one of my descendants. But when you make that blow, it's actually going to crush you and undo you. Galatians chapter 3, Paul explains and gives us context to this passage in Genesis 3 and tells us about the offspring of Eve, that it's going to be a descendant of Eve, descendant of Abraham. And he's not speaking of many descendants, but of a singular descendant, he says, and that is Jesus Christ that a savior was promised to redeem and to restore all things right after we broke all things, that he would come to fulfill the law and the prophets, to become a curse, to remove the curse of sin and death that we have inherited and that we have earned. And that good news comes right away in our story. And we learn in the New Testament, he comes in human form in the flesh and he has dwelt among us coming from the line of Adam and Eve and of Abraham as the scriptures promise over and over. This is a story of a God who does not abandon us at our weakest and most vulnerable moment. He could have because he could have looked at Adam and Eve and said, I told you so. You shouldn't have done it. Now it's time to pay the piper and that's on you. But he doesn't. He says, I will pay and I will make things right for his people, and for his creation. Paul tells us in verses 19 through 22, for in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless, and above reproach before him. Why? So that we can be with him and be with our God as we were designed to be. Paul tells us the main character of our story has willingly sacrificed his body through his death for us, for our children, for our children's children, and for all those who believe in him as their Lord and Savior, that he has made peace between us and God by the blood of the cross so that we might be with God, our creator, for forevermore. You want to know why, in a lot of Hollywood movies, why the narrative of self-sacrifice is so prevalent, but it's also so powerful. It's because the act of self-sacrifice 
right? To save others reflects the main arc of the greatest redemptive act in history of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us to redeem and the promise to come back and restore us again. I love Marvel movies. I love Avengers Endgame. And there is a moment in that movie where the cameras zoom in on Iron Man, Tony Stark. He's wearing the Infinity Gauntlet with Infinity Stones. He essentially has all the power in the world in the palm of his hands, right? And he knows if he snaps his finger, he can restore that which Thanos, which the word Thanatos in Greek means death, means when then death just killed half of humanity in the universe, right, in the movie, he knows if he snaps his finger that he'll be able to save, right, all of humanity and restore it back to the way it was. But he knows it'll take his life. His life will be ended if he does that. And in that movie, in that moment, when you watch that, you feel something. There is a depth when you watch the way they cinematically set that scene up and when it happens. And it's because as image bearers of Christ, which we are image bearers of God, movies, scenes like that of self-sacrifice remind us of the real self-sacrifice and the deeper call to redemption and restoration that is only found in the cross of Jesus Christ. We feel something as it points us to a truer story, not the Marvel universe, our real universe. And it reminds us that there is a God who can do this. Our biblical story, it tells us there is a God who does this, has the power to do this. But he doesn't just promise to restore all things to the back the way they were. He actually says, I'm going to make all things new. For your body, for this world, and for my people, I'm going to make it all new in the heavens and the earth. And this is where we see a beautiful picture and an end in the story in Revelation chapter 21. This is what John says about Jesus' final return. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea, which is an image of chaos in scripture, was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. For he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and they are true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. Revelation chapters 21 and 22, they describe for us Jesus' return. And his return is going to be a day that is comprehensible because we've never had a day like this. A day of such beauty and power and majesty and hope and joy and healing and restoration for those who love and trust Jesus because on that day, he will restore and make new all things in heaven and earth, invisible and all that is visible. And this is the glorious sin that we long for We long for this. It's the end of the big story, but it's actually the beginning of a new story of us being with God for all eternity in paradise with him as we were originally intended to be. 
The restoration that we are talking about here, this is not that Jesus is just going to take all the broken pieces of our lives and of our world and simply put them back together again like Humpty Dumpty. He's actually going to take all the broken pieces of our lives and of this world, and he's going to make something new, something glorious, a new beautiful mosaic out of it, something like we've never seen before. We will see sights we've never seen, sounds we've never heard. We will have harmony and intimacy with others who love the Lord and who've gone before us to be reunited with them, but we will also be with our God and perfect harmony and intimacy and nearness like we have never experienced. And frankly, it's really hard to imagine. But this is the hope, the living hope that we just sung about that our story doesn't just end with restoring things to how they are now, but that there's a new hope, a restoration of all things being made new. The story that we have been diving into, it tells us our past. It gives us guidance and hope in the present, but it also tells us of the future hope that is sure for us. And I know life is difficult and we forget the good news of this story, but this is why we're here today. This is why we come every Sunday to worship, to be reminded of the true story, that there is hope that is coming, that we have been redeemed, that our sins have been paid for, but that also Jesus Christ is gonna restore all things. And if he's come once, he is going to come again because his promises are sure and he always fulfills his promises. But what's our mission as a people and our story? What are we called to in our story? We're called to love the story. We're called to love God. We're called to love this story, to know this story, to receive this story. But we're also called to love others as Christ followers, are we not? And how do we love others? We tell this story. We invite somebody next week to come sit with you and hear Pieces of this beautiful story about redemption and restoration and the God who loves them and loves this world. We get involved with a life group where we get to regularly discuss this story to be reminded of the goodness of God regularly. And as parents, we have the responsibility to tell our children this story, to remind them that their king loves them that the king is coming back for them and is gonna restore all the brokenness that they see and experience in their schools, in their home, with their field, everything. This is the story we are called to tell this generation and the next. And it's a good story. It's a holy story. It is our story. It is the big story that is told in the Bible. And as we respond to this story, we're gonna sing a song, The Goodness of Jesus. And with sincerity, we can sing, come find what the world cannot offer. Come and find your joy here and Jesus complete. Taste the living water and never thirst again. Rest here in his, Jesus' wondrous peace. And we're gonna sing that. And may we sing that with sincerity because we have it. Christ has come and he's coming again. Amen? Amen. Join me in prayer. Lord, we love you. Lord, we need you. Help us to be a people, Lord, who see the comprehensive nature of this story of creation, the fall, Lord, restoration. Help us to love, Lord, your redemption that you have come to tell people about, Lord, you who's died on the cross for us to redeem us from the penalty of sin and who has conquered death. Lord, help us to a people who know this story, who love this story, and Lord, who tell this story. Because Lord, there are so many people who need to hear good news, to know that good news has come to save them. Lord, we love you, and Lord, we absolutely need you. And we pray this in your holy and precious name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.